Hare Krishna. That's Hare Krishna. Krishna. Welcome back to the Monks Podcast. Thank you, Prabhu. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here, as always. Yes, it's my, you could say, intellectual and spiritual pleasure to have you here. And of course, we are having a lot of ethical ed- edification. So our two podcasts build up the subject and I thought today we could uh, take it further. So we'll talk about what if if we as a movement are to have a moral philosophy, what would, what would it look like? What would be its broad features? So maybe I can just quickly summarize what we discussed in the previous two podcasts. Okay. So in, uh, broadly, we were talking about how there can be either, uh, you could say, inadvertent moral continence or there can be in- intentional uh, transgressions. Mm-hmm. And especially when those happen not far away outside, but within our movement itself. And that raises uncomfortable questions. And uh, so how do we deal with that? Do we deny it? Do we just blame one person? Or do we actually examine whether there is something within the ethical environment which is leading to these kind of problems? Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. then we talk about some factors which may cause this is we may focus only on spiritual values and not look at what are our specific values. Mm -hmm. make people more vulnerable to either themselves succumbing or letting others exploit whichever way it might work out. And then in that connection, so you also discussed about morality is specifically generally, okay, this is, these are the moral values. This is right. This is wrong. Ethics is more involving deliberation to understand, to analyze various situations and come to a more reasoned understanding of how moral values are to be Let's say chosen in what moral choices are to be made in particular situations. Mm-hmm. And of course, we discussed briefly about hermeneutics. And then, so there are moral issues where we know what is right, but we are not able to follow it. So mm-hmm. in that case, we discussed that it's not that we are uh, in, we don't want to go into either complete denial and nonchalance, nor do we want to burden the person down with guilt. If we actually understand ethical philosophy, then we'll understand what level a person can practice. So, mm-hmm. say for example, you said that not that with respect to say following brahmachari life, expecting people to follow it might itself be beyond their their power of agency. Mm-hmm. So that's why there can a lot of guilt that can come because of that. You mentioned that people felt like coming out; they were like coming out when they were they had to change their ashram, mm-hmm. which is unnecessary. And then second, we talked about ethical issues where we ourselves might not be clear about mm. what uh, our stands would be. And mm. uh, say, for example, milk that is produced through processes that are involving violence toward cows. And mm. so for this, we need to draw from our tradition, but at the same time, we have to engage with contemporary issues. And then we also discussed about what, con- you said the contemporary thinkers, what they say, you know, they are they have thought about the world today. And if we want to engage with the world today, then we do need to engage with those thinkers also. And mm. ultimately, we can see Krishna, we can reach the divine, quoted Prabhupada, that we can reach Krishna through, in fact, all branches of knowledge are meant to ultimately re- culminate in uh, knowing, realizing Krishna. And if we can show the world also that devotees can engage in, uh, in reasonable or reasoned moral reflection, uh, discussions in the mainstream discourse, then that will increase shraddha of people. So hmm. all, rather than talking about some preaching as bridge preaching, all preaching is bridging. Just different bridges can be of different forms. Hmm. And uh, when we talk about ethical reflection, eth- ethics, you talk about three domains based on Bhaktivinoda Thakur's Naam Rachi, Jiudaya and Vaishnava Seva. That hmm. one's own well, personal welfare, one's uh, functioning in the devotee community and one's hmm. contribution in the broader world. So in hmm. one sense, ethics pervades all aspects of our uh, of a devotee's life and so we came to the point that we need uh, ethics is extremely important and uh, we came to the point that okay broad contours if we can have how do we move forward to discuss ethical philosophy so mm-hmm. or what would be Iskand's ethical philosophy or Kaudya Vaishnava Vedic philosophy moral philosophy look like would you want to mm-hmm. add something to no that's fine you have a good memory. I, I admire the way you remembered what we've been discussing. Thank you. I try to recollect as much as I can. Thank you. 
Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think before moving on to what our moral philosophy may be, um, I mean, obviously, there's a question of whether you want a singular moral philosophy or allow some degree of philosophies. Um, but my aim is probably first to establish some broad framework under the premise that if we don't have that framework, then we're not really accountable to very much. And it's easy to fall prey to a certain form of emotivism. And, and emotivism means where it, it's that idea that most morality is merely an expression of our subjective opinions. Um, so it's very easy just to select certain um, philosophical concepts or beliefs, certain practices, and thirdly, certain values, and, and, and try and explain our moral stances or ascertain our moral stances using those. But that is far from having a coherent moral philosophy um, the, to which we're accountable and might give us more rigor in our addressing moral issues and applying them in life. So I think it's important to have one. I, I, there are a few criteria I have, and I could read some of those. I, I've listed here four. No, First, go to that. Sorry if I interrupt you. So of course. So we use the word moral philosophy. Say we can talk about say Gaudiya Vaishnava philosophy, or we talk about say Vedic philosophy. Hmm? Hmm. So when we use the word moral philosophy. Uh, in what sense are we using the word philosophy? Is it? I, yeah. yeah. I mean, w w one could use the word moral theology if one wanted. Um, and I don't think we have time to discuss the kind of complex relationship between theology and philosophy. Um, I, I, use, I tend to use the word philosophy because I'm a great believer in the ability to be an independent critical thinker and still come to the conclusion that Krishna consciousness is a suitable or viable philosophy to live by. In other words, to, in other words, to be a critical thinker and to make that commitment which is necessary when you're part of a tradition. Okay. In other words, between personal autonomy and received wisdom. Mm -hmm. what the ISKCON standards are, and what I personally think. So, and so that means what you're saying mm -hmm. is, we can, in one sense, realization, not just received knowledge, but so we can come by our own reasoned inferences to the teachings that are given in scripture. Is Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Oh, thoughtful men, relish Srimad Bhagavatam. Oh, so you are saying that that could mean that thoughtful men by their thinking could actually see themselves the truth of truths given in Srimad Bhagavatam and then they would relish it. Absolutely. I mean, unless one has some some kind of um, ability for or propensity towards reflection and critical thought uh, and introspection, uh, how does one accept Krishna consciousness or indeed any religion or philosophy in life? Uh, and the danger is and if, by the way, there's a lot of discussion about in ethics, about religious ethics and non-religious ethics or religious values and non-religious values. I actually think that that classification um, has limited use and it actually often conceals more useful categories and tensions which we need to solve or resolve. Uh, particularly the tension, let me give you an example, and I'll come to this later because I think this is central to the human condition, is the tension between sentiment and reason. Okay. Now that tension, despite the claims of the Enlightenment thinkers and those who followed them, um, is there everywhere. It's not that just religious people are prone to sentimentalism. Hmm. Yeah. In fact, what, I mean, politicians no. they operate on sentiment. Most political oh, actions they oh, they galvanize yeah. people through sentiments. Absolutely. Um, 
So I think actually the religious, non-religious um, conversation, while being somewhat important, can often be used to overshadow some uh, more foundational concerns, which are central to the human condition, uh, oh. and, and detract us from from coming to some more useful conclusions. Beautiful. So just to articulate what you said is that, so when we word philosophy, generally the conventional understanding of philosophy means you focus on reasoning and try to arrive at conclusion of truths. Yes. Whereas theology often involves beginning with revelation and then doing some kind of reasoning based on the revelations. So what you said is that when you use, you prefer to use the word moral philosophy instead of moral theology, in the sense that we 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 can use our own, as you said, independent critical thinking ability, and then come to the truths of Krishna consciousness. Absolutely. Okay. Perfect. Otherwise, what use is one's conviction? A man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. Hmm. Now that doesn't mean there doesn't have to be some um, exercise of that ability to put aside one's own convictions and to sometimes submit submissively to authority, mm. as one must do even if one goes to school. Um, or when one has a parent, it, it has to be there. Uh, but ultimately, unless one's convictions become one's own, one never becomes Shastra Chakshus. Shastra Chakshus doesn't mean what one who actually simply quotes Shastra, although that's important, it means ones whose vision is the same as Shastra. Now, what is Shastra? Shastra is nothing but the realization, realizations of the pure devotees. Oh, so it is In also many, what they have seen with the Chakshu. I yeah. think Jiva Goswami also says this, that he uses the word called Divya Pratyaksha. Yeah, yeah. Like divine perception, like protection. Divya, divya Prachaksha is the highest. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's the high Tattva Darshan. One has to be yeah. Tattva Darshan. So, um, I mean, if one tries to expunge experience from the whole educational process or scholarly process, one really is killing the self because the self is the source of experience. Of course, in modern discourse, there's a lot of... Um, <laughs> probably less credible pleas to, you know, um, acknowledge my personal experience as if, as if my personal ex experience is automatically correct. It isn't. Um, certainly one should discern whether one's experience is valid or to some degree is um, due to a form of illusion or, or whatever. Um, but at the same time, one cannot, by privileging Shastra Chakshus, one cannot um, thereby marginalize or minimize the other two main sources of evidence for those who follow the path of Vedanta. Um, uh, those two other two sources of evidence, of course, are Prachaksha and Anuman. Rather, the process of perceiving, sorry, the processes of perceiving and rationalizing have to be purified. So the senses are purified, the mind and intelligence are purified, so that one's perceptions are in accord with those great uh, philosophers and, and, and devotees who helped compile the, compute, the cumulative knowledge and wisdom embedded in our scriptures and passed down through the parampara which is a scholarly tradition true yeah and when you are saying uh, perceiving and say reasoning has to be purified that you are saying it doesn't just mean uh, top down acceptance by saying purification means that by our conscious uh, conscious experience conscious uh, assimilation we our perception and our reasoning naturally aligns with scripture. It is not that it is, it is by, say, force of diktat. It is more by assimilation. Absolutely. And we'll come to the Bhagavad Gita in a minute. And um, the question may arise when studying the Bhagavad Gita or Hindu or Vedic ethics or Vaishnava ethics, 
uh, more broadly. The, the question may arise, how does it relate to Western approaches? And one of the predominant ones is called divine command theory. And later on, I'll discuss this and say it doesn't fit very well into the idea of divine command theory, although there may be elements of that. And those elements may be appropriate at certain stages of one's ethical progress. But let's come to that later, actually. Yeah. Could I just go through a few of these? I think the first criterion I've got is that it must help address some of those internal challenges we've, we've listed falling in those categories of moral issues, ethical issues, and what I term loosely hermeneutical issues, which are those um, controversial statements in Srila Prabhupada's books, which are being highlighted more because of a change in the moral environment. Secondly, um, in order to address those and to be fit for purpose, it must have some autonomy. It has to be somewhat separate, um, codified and articulated separately from the rest of our theology. Okay. Thirdly, um, and, and this is obvious to many, but I'll state it, it must be true to our own heritage. We have to ensure that whatever principles, rules, practices, um, meta-ethical concepts or whatever, uh, or virtues we derive, uh, sorry, we, we um, en encompass within our moral philosophy, it, it must be true to our heritage. But number four, and this balances this out a little bit, it must be capable of authentic dialogue with others. And if we're going to enter into dialogue with people who are from another culture, we have to be able to express it in their language. And by expressing it in terms of their language, we're looking at some of the concepts that are inevitably associated with that language. In other words, you're talking about a somewhat different worldview. Is it possible or is it not possible to have such exchange on um, some issues which are very much to do with the private domain? Uh, probably some like Wittgenstein would say it's not really that feasible. Um, but uh, I, I think our tradition says it is. Um, that, of course, is epitomized, if you like, by the ability of Srila Prabhupada to, ex to attract and nurture devotees who have previously had nothing to do with the Vedic, Vaishnava, or Indic traditions. Beautiful. Um, so, but at the same time, while um, valuing the idea of a common or Sanatan wisdom, Sanatan dharma, or what perhaps Aldous, Aldous Huxley would call a perennial wisdom, um, we do have to take account of context and particularities, uh, and therefore it, it has to be capable of dialogue. And my thesis is that uh, not only is there moral insight within traditions outside the Anglo-American academic traditions, uh, specifically within the Indian or Vedic traditions, um, but that uh, the thinkers in that tradition are capable of, enga of engaging with that rigorously and answering some of the key questions and indeed capable of making some positive contributions and perhaps bringing in some alternative viewpoints that may be helpful to those conversations, those ethical, philosophical conversations. Yeah. So I've got, I, I've, got, I've got four criteria there. It should help I address our... Fourth, true to our heritage, capable of authentic dialogue. What are the first and second? Can you um, it help, it's really fit for purpose in addressing our own internal challenges. Okay. Second, it's somewhat autonomous. It has to be distilled out of our broad theology. While accepting, you know, that there may be a relationship between our meta-ethical concepts and sensibilities and our ontology or our epistemology and so on. Third one, it's true to our own heritage, but four, it must also be capable of authentic dialogue with others. Yes, bro. So can you explain the need for it being autonomous? 
in the sense that it has to be based on, as you said, based on uh, true to our heritage, the third point. So, yeah, autonomous means it's um, self reliant, it's not dependent um, or, or self governing, if you like. Personal autonomy um, is the phrase often used and much valued these days. In other words, um, perhaps there's a better term. But in other words, we have to codify what is essentially a Krishna conscious moral philosophy rather than, than, than something else. And we need to be careful about when we're discussing any issue, um, bringing in truths and values that are somewhere ex external or superfluous to the particular topic we're discussing. And this is natural in life. I think there's a, there's a, a kind of pedagogical approach here um, when we learn at school, we have subjects and there's a systematic education. But when we go into the outside world and we want to do something practical, such as building a house, for example, then we draw from a wide range of disciplines. Um, so if we're addressing moral, of course, maybe that, that metaphor is a bit counterproductive thinking about it. But the point I'm trying to make is that actually in this case, it would be get best to have somewhat of a singular moral philosophy that helps us address those uh, issues we've discussed. Okay, so when you're saying it's autonomous, you're not saying that it is, it does not depend on scripture. What you're saying is autonomous in the sense that it is a distinct no, no. field of study. Yeah, it's a branch of knowledge, if you like, to put it simply, a branch of Vedic and Vaishnava knowledge. And of course, our tradition already has a, um, a propensity for dividing up its knowledge into compartments, yeah, into categories at least. Yeah. Yes, bro. so it makes sense. That's perfect, sir. So in one sense, you have, when the first and the fourth point, so the you could say the first is more for in personal application and the fourth is more for outreach application. Is it something like that? Um, to a degree, yes, but that's not entirely true because actually, if we're if like, I, like I'm from a British background, I'll never become an Indian. Okay. Um, what I've called previously our internal my internal architecture hmm. will always be structured according to my place of birth and my upbringing and so on, and therefore inevitably I'm going to engage with Krishna consciousness and the various branches of knowledge that are contained within Srila Prabhupada's books through that identity, through that perception. That isn't to say that I, I don't need to change in some ways, but, but there may be some aspects of my character uh, and my psychology and so on, which cannot be changed. Okay. So in one sense, this is talking more about the individual's personal context. And yes. It, yeah. Okay. It, yeah. Well, even for our own development, and then also for reaching out to others. Yeah. True. Makes sense. So these are what you said are the basic features of the moral philosophy, or how do you ref refer to these? Yes. Areas? Yeah, the basic features, or, or or some of the the criteria that help us formulate such a, a philosophy. So I'm suggesting the use of some bridging language and bridging concepts. Um, and a central theme I'm going to mention here, because it, it, it just came to my mind and I think it's suitable, is that um, I think we'll get a lot of commonality, perhaps in two ways. The first is to acknowledge that the questions we ask will probably bear more similarity than the answers we give. Yeah. Although we have to, we have to acknowledge that different cultures may ask different questions. I, I, that's the point as well. But I think we have to acknowledge that. And the second is, I want to um, stress the importance of acknowledging um, the need to understand what I would call the human condition. I guess there's somewhat of a psychological perspective there. What is it that we all go through 
irrespective of whether we're born in a particular country or follow a particular religion or whatever. And I think we'll find a lot of commonality there also. True. Yeah. Yeah. No, I read this book on world religions. I mean, I studied world religions about 10 years ago quite in detail. So one book I read. So this author, uh, he started by saying that before you study any religion, just start with two assumptions. That people everywhere are similar to you. And people mm -hmm. everywhere want resources to get on with the business of life. And they turn to religion because it serves as a resource for them. So no. I think that, that in one sense describes the human condition that we all, there are there are significant level of similarities. Yeah, precisely. Yes, bro. Yeah. So I think it was Ernest Hem Hem Hemingway, who was a novelist, who said, if any story goes on long enough, someone's going to die. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Or, or the or the story will end in death. I forget exactly the words he used. Okay. But I think that's something we can all um, acknowledge that the kind of life's narrative, if it goes on long enough, will end in death. And it doesn't matter whether we're uh, English or Indian. Uh, I think we can uh, say with some certainty that that's true. Mm. Mm. And yeah, and, and so those questions, those 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 important questions, life's ultimate questions, um, are often related to morality and ethics, or to aspects of it such as human fulfillment. Yes, bro. So we all want to live, you could say, a meaningful life. We all want to interact with each other in a in a way that is, it is mutually beneficial. Some people may want to be exploitative, or ultimately. It is, we want to, we are social creatures. So we want relationships that are sustainable, we could say. Well, that's one, that's one element of life. Yeah. Which seems, uh, I mean, some to it try to escape the social elements of life. You know, the, the hermit and the renouncer may, some may try to uh, separate himself from others. Uh, and, and that raises the question of whether that social intercourse is something which is essential to our nature. Okay, that's or something idea. external to it. Yeah, it's, it's a pertinent question. Yes, no. So, could I run through some of the categories, some of the kind of metaethical or even metaphysical concepts that are there? Um, I'm basing um, these largely on the Bhagavad Gita, which. Um, although it contains many of the ontological concepts and some strong allusions to epistemology is a response to an ethical dilemma that Arjuna was um, agonizing over on the battlefield. Um, the first one, I think, is the idea of the Atman, the eternal self, um, and the the perception that wrong ideas of who we are, our identity, are the root cause of all strife and immorality. Okay, so you are saying this is a, this is an ethical value, or what, what exactly? Well, <laughs> is it ethical or is it ontological? Um, and this is this is an important discussion because this this is a ongoing debate. Um, it's often accredited to David Hume, who suggested there was a divide between values and facts. Um, it's often called Hume's guillotine, uh, and there's been ongoing discourse uh, between what they call the non-naturalists, who suggest there's a difference, and the naturalists. Um, it's complex. Um, not an easy subject to discuss, but um, my own thesis, and I'm working on this, is that when our knowledge is based on external objects or the subject of our knowledge um, 
sorry, the object of our knowledge would be is the correct term actually, um, is matter, then we tend to exacerbate the divide between value and fact. And when we actually focus alternatively on the self, then this brings together those sources of, uh, of sense and sensibility, namely the ethical and the more cognitive. You need to unpack that through a little bit. Yeah, well, it, it, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to unpack it myself at the moment. Let me try to um, basically, in other words, what, what, what's, the, what's the relationship between facts and values? And in the modern world, there is very much a, a, an idea that there are facts that exist independent of our subjective experience or our judgment. And that is challenged by quite a few philosophers of science and other people. Do facts exist independent of theories? But that is the main idea. That is the absolutely. Absolutely. Well, it, 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 I mean, it, it, it's, it's often accredited to logical positivism, which um, has been to a large degree discredited in academic circles. But there is a huge residue of belief in some of those ideas within popular society. Um, I think we need to really question the idea of a fact existing separate of any type of evaluation. And specifically, the idea that facts exist separate from those who propound the facts or those who advocate them. Or to put it another way, that knowledge exists separate from the knower. Mm. That's the way the Bhagavad Gita would, would perhaps phrase it. And I think that there's, there's a misconception there. Uh, it may be tied up with the separation of knowledge and the knower may have been um, what's the word, fostered by the, the printing press. Really? Okay. Yes. In other words, the, the modern idea that we now have written knowledge rather than oral transmission, because when there's oral transmission, one is always aware that the speaker is there. When one has a book, the speaker's or writer's name may be on the book. And one may to different degrees, you know, feel the voice of the author, but there is a degree of separation that's not there in oral trans transmission. Mm. What to speak of when we get to the contemporary world and we have virtual reality, and one can go to a website that's advertising some type of um, slimming pill, and there's all pictures of men and women looking down microscopes and wearing clinically white coats. But perhaps the website is run by someone with a garage up in Bolton near Manchester with a bank account in... Cyprus, perhaps it's a scam. So, so what is the point you're making by this? The point is that the identity of the speaker is not evident. So the information we're getting or the knowledge we're getting is disconnected from the person. Okay, makes sense. Yeah, and 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 this has consequences for how we receive knowledge and, and, and some modern phenomenon like fake news, for example, what to speak of internet scams, where one pretends to be a pretty young girl and is uh, suggesting a liaison with a 60 year old Englishman who gets taken in and then his girlfriend requests him to send some money. But really there's no pretty girl at the other end. There's a scammer. Hmm. So what I'm suggesting is hap has, has happened through this evolution is that the knower has been separated from the knowledge. Knowledge has become a commodity. Interesting. Which we buy and sell. That's, that's a whole other subject, of course. Um, so 
the broad thesis is that when our knowledge is directed scientifically, we could say, um, towards matter, then there is a tendency to separate value from knowledge. And when we value. focus on, on the self, okay. and we, we're more concerned perhaps for wisdom than what we now call knowledge, then it tends to bring the two together. That's true. So, you know, in one sense, uh, if you consider the historical evolution of the conception of knowledge also, I think it was Socrates and Plato who said that knowledge is virtue. And that's what the Bhagavad Gita also says when he talks about 20 characters of knowledge. But yeah. Franz, Francis Bacon, he said knowledge yeah. is power. And he was referring more to knowledge as technological power to subjugate nature to human will so that natural, cal natural calamities and problems caused by nature could be decreased. So you can see the external focus over the centuries coming up. Yeah, yeah, def definitely. And uh, I think Michael Sandel from Sandel from Chicago University has mentioned this, how there was this concept that knowledge is equated with power, probably through philosophers such as Foucault. Um, but it's interesting how in the Bhagavad Gita, knowledge is equated with certain values or human virtues. Hmm. So there is a limited understanding of what knowledge, what constitutes knowledge. True. Sure. Mm. I mean, more broad, more broadly, rather. I mean, there's a problem with the word fact, and, and perhaps I could just discuss this very briefly. The trouble with the word, there's an expression that we often use, and you'll see uh, those who are debating, perhaps on television or radio or, or on the internet or wherever. Um, or you may see it in real life, they'll use this expression, the facts speak for themselves. Yeah, do they? It's a good question. Well, it's, it's an interesting expression because if you take a more, let's say scientific um, point of view, perhaps based on logical positivism, I guess, then you would suggest, well, th th there's two alternatives. If, are you using that metaphorically? And if you are, you're endorsing the use of metaphor as a way of conveying knowledge. So one can obviously say, no, I'm not using it metaphorically. Now then you've got a real problem because I want you to bring me an example aware of fact has spoken for itself. Yeah, how can the facts don't speak for themselves at all? So facts don't speak. There is always um, I'm not I'm not going to completely decry the fact <laughs> I've used the word <laughs> that there might that there might be objective truths. Um, although I'd want to qualify my use of the word objective there. Um, hmm. one, There's some important questions here, actually. I think uh, one, sorry, one aspect of uh, this fact speaking for themselves, that the problem with that is seen through statistics. You know, by statistics, actually, one can prove anything. Can start with a particular agenda, and we can one can mine up statistics for proving whatever we want. Yeah, precisely. There's lies, damn lies, and statistics, as someone yeah. famously said. That's yeah, true. and actually, if you study research methods, what one will understand that there is a kind of professional code of conduct, values again, that one is expected to follow in order to make one's research valid. But, but there's also, you know, a much more deep, there's a deeper aspect to that in research, and that is asking ourselves, how much are some of my tacit philosophies influencing this research? Mm. In other words, is the way I construct my questions going to determine the response I get to those questions? And do those questions somehow reflect my own mindset and even my own um, 
evaluative conclusions. I think Thomas Kuhn talked about this with respect to paradigms and structure of scientific revolutions that scientists do research within a particular framework, and they mm. even and uh, facts which challenge that framework, that paradigm, are swept aside. So, in yeah. one sense, there is research, but it is with a certain amount of framework, with, within a certain framework itself. Yeah, precisely. So, is it possible to escape the constraints and conditioning? that are context, I use the word context in somewhat of a, a, a more Vedic sense, uh, the mind and body that we're situated in, is, how, is it possible to escape that? Will our, what I often call tacit philosophy, um, and some of the views and values I have, uh, which are not necessarily true, will they always influence the process of knowledge? And how do I escape those? Is it possible to escape those? Can I actually come to the philosophical table without any assumptions? Of course, that's impossible. The more valid question is, how can I escape those assumptions? How can I interrogate those assumptions? And perhaps, as I would suggest, how can I live a life that helps me become more virtuous, which might also help me escape those assumptions and prejudgments? Hmm. In one sense, when you say we come to the mode of goodness, that uh, one of the characteristics of goodness is said to be illumination. So one illumination yeah. is we become aware of our own assumptions, our own biases. Yeah. Otherwise, they're so close to us that we just, they shape our vision, but we have we never have vision of them. We don't see them at all. They shape everything we see. Yeah. And, and therefore, my perception is with everyone I meet, and I get to know a little bit, um, except myself, is that I see a, um, I see something in them where I think, oh, I, I admire them for so many ways. Why do we see something? I say, I wish they would change that because if they change that, everything else would be so much brighter for them. And of course, um, I was being perhaps a little sarcastic when I, or, or whatever, ironic when I said that I don't have, I, I, it, that's not applicable to me. Of course it's applicable to me, but I don't see my own shortcomings. Mm. My wife does, but I don't. So, I think it's a very important question, how do I overcome those? And therefore, one could say, or one could conclude that a certain amount of self-knowledge is important. Now, again, um, this is not a discourse that is exclusive to those who follow the Bhagavad Gita or admire the Bhagavad Gita. There is a whole con been a conversation going on for many years, particularly in the social sciences, about research methods and the whole idea of reflexivity. And reflexivity is a, a um, challenge, kind of more colonial to research, where the scholars studied the nation somewhere else, the idea, someone else, and the idea of reflexivity is that I, as a researcher, am also part of my own research. Oh. I'm the object of, I'm not only the subject of research who's conducting it, I'm the object of my research as well. Notice how this reflects on the um, the dictum, you know, from from was it Socrates or Plato? Know thyself. Yes. Socrates. Yeah. yeah. Know thyself. So therefore, the the whole concept of Atman is extremely important for us. And note how. In response to Arjuna's dilemma, um, verses 211 to 216, six verses there, are all extremely important um, in, in, in considering what a moral framework may look like. Very, very important. Please. That's significant. So, For example, I, would, I, I, I could draw one conclusion if I... No, carry on. Go on. No, carry on. No, so you're taking this dialogue of sometimes we just make a 
simple assertion we are not the body we are the soul and the uh, ramifications of that we talk you know so don't be attached to worldly pleasures but it is not just the ramifications are not just sensual they are also cognitive and uh, that then that cognitive dimensions will affect our we could say ethical perceptions or ethical reflections also so this is an astute observation yeah what is the connection between how we see the world and how we respond to the world including our moral responses hmm we'll come to that in a minute or or i could mention it now let me let me cross it off the list actually one of the concepts that i had listed here i've got about 10 is the concept of maya illusion and that means uh, maya that which is not or accepting something as one object but it's actually something else and particularly accepting the self to be the body the physical body mm it's not difficult to see the ethical ramifications of that if we look at the present uh stress on identity politics and the um quite natural opposition to racism sexism and other forms of discrimination the challenge is that modern discourse um while having that sentiment and expressing that sentiment is in my judgment not sufficiently rooted in a concept of the self that substantiates that equality and it certainly doesn't allow us to accommodate human and celebrate human diversity so there's a big tension here how do we promote equality and how do we celebrate diversity and how do we explain them rationally rigorously so the concept of maya is there. i mean um shankaracharya's uh, metaphor it's called the snake rope metaphor it is very useful he gives the example of how walking out at night one may see a rope it doesn't happen us to us here in England because we don't have many snakes but there in India it's really I, i think you may have some stories i don't know um yeah. but you're walking out at night you see a rope you think it's a snake you feel fear oh the fear the, the fear is real it's a real emotion mm. and one responds of course we're talking ethics but um uh, that's another subject what's the relationship between emotions and and ethics but assuming there is a a relationship um i i think here we can see that there's a strong cognition then between the strong relationship between our cognition and how we respond morally if our morality is tied to our emotions but that that emotion is real but it's based on an illusion it's based on the wrong perception if our eyes were more perfect or we had a better torch we would see immediately this is a rope not a snake we wouldn't feel the fear mm. so this is important uh, and really in a sense our own moral philosophy may may resonate well with plato who used the cave analogy plato's yeah. cave analogy so he put a lot quite a lot of emphasis on this cognition in order in, in developing um moral moral sense and sensibility correct cognition mm so you're using the word sense and sensibility together i know that's a name of a novel also but in what sense are you putting them together here oh i'm probably i'm probably using them not quite correctly but um jane austen's novel um I I think she was comparing two sisters. I'm not I'm not familiar with the yeah, novel. Yeah, that I yeah, that's the, one um, was more rational and the other was more you could Yeah, say. emotional. Yeah. I'll come to that in a minute because I think I'm going to propose that that tension between our feelings and our reason is, is central to the human condition 
Um, the problem is that, and this is being disputed now, much more than perhaps previously, the problem is that uh, there is the idea that emotions are bad and reason is good. Oh, that is, I think that is being significantly critiqued nowadays, but maybe 50 years ago, 70 yes. years ago, it was, it is considered like obvious reality. Who will question it? Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I, I, I mean, I think there's some underlying truth there. Um, but particularly coming from a Bhakti tradition, which stresses the importance of spiritual emotion, um, we've got to interrogate that very, very carefully. And I suggest that the Bhagavad Gita, and we'll come to this later, it really does um, try to resolve that tension through the process of bhakti. Um, but I'd like to kind of leave that a little to, an, to another time, actually, because uh, we'll be coming to that. But I think it, it is actually central to our discussion. So, Prabhu, let me read, if you don't mind, I'll retrace how you put it, if I understood rightly. So you said, we, when we're discussing about ethics, you said the foundation should be that there has to be self-understanding. And it has to begin with the self rather than the world. And the reason for that, you said, is if you consider these three things, there is cognition, there is emotion, and there is action. So if we consider ethics to be about the way we act, often our actions are driven more by emotions, or they should be driven by reason. And if those emotions are based on false cognition. Then, then the, the ethical actions are unlikely or unsustainable because those emotions will drive us. So in mm -hmm. one sense, we need, so that to have right cognition, we need to start not with the outer world because as the outer world is the domain of Maya, it's changing and it, as you said, separates the knowledge from the knower when you focus mm -hmm. on that. So, the, so to start with right cognition means to start with self-understanding. And when you start with that self-understanding, then based on that, we can have a, you could say, a, a, a solid footing for reason. So, and then with that reason, of course, you're not denying emotion, but with that solid footing of reason, then we can have, uh, we can have ethical action. Is this how you are, I, I understand it right? Or I probably didn't express myself very well, and I'm, I'm probably going a little um, diverting from the way I would have explained this. Um, I think what I'm alluding to is, is one of the big challenges in moral philosophy post, yeah, some, some often it's attributed to David Hume. The, what is the relationship between facts and values? Although I'd like to yeah. express that is what is the relationship between cognition and values? Okay, I think what David Hume you say this, from what is, we can never come to one what should. Oh. Absolutely, yes. And he, he, he said, you know, he, he wrote that it's amazing how many philosophical writings are expressing what is, and they suddenly jump without any substantiation to what should be. Uh, and I think, by the way, I've got um, admiration for David Hume. I think he raised some very, very important questions about what is the role of the emotions in action. Uh, and, and we'll come back to that later because there's a concept in the Gita, um, which even though it's in a sense, the conclusion of the Gita, and many writers have pointed this out, it's also a paradox. And that is of detached action. What's the Sanskrit? Nishkarma yoga? Nishkarma? Nishkam yoga? karma, nishkam karma yoga. Nishka, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, but th th there's, there's a paradox there. Can you have action with complete detachment? Because generally, motion or action is linked to emotion. That's beautifully put. And I think, um, I think he's, he's quite right in saying that you cannot. I think the idea of detached action is actually paradoxical and needs resolving. And I'm going to suggest that the concept of bhakti and the ideals of bhakti resolve that tension. Mm 
but I don't want to discuss it too much because I think we're probably jumping ahead now. Mm. So even though in one sense, sentiment is seen as um, subordinate, if you like, to reason, we must also look at what David Hume say, said in, in that really reason is the, is the maidservant of the passions. which is a, a nice way of putting it. Reason is the maidservant of the passions. So we, we, have, to, we have to look at that. Well, that's not necessarily a laudable state, isn't it? Is it more of a, it's a sad reflection? Because I think uh, Freud also said something like that reason is like a small canoe on the turbulent ocean of emotion. So he spoke it in the sense that we may reason, but when the emotion, the waves start coming, the reason gets, gets tossed away. So, is he saying it in a uh, celebratory sense or just a descriptive sense or like a gloomy sense? Or it's difficult to know? Mm, I, I, I need to think a little more about that. Um, in some ways, I'd say that he's disparaging ethics and saying um, or ethical responses or moral responses, which are based on the emotions. But he's also raising the question of the fact that that's an inescapable fact. Mm. I'm using the word fact after pulling it apart. Um, Way of things. Yeah. So, so he, he's, he's setting an interesting tension. I, I'd like to explore that a little later. Sure. I mean, there's a lot of recent literature within moral philosophy perhaps in the last, I would say, 15, 20 years on um, the role of the emotions in morality. And obviously that has an affinity with uh, Vaishnav thought and those traditions that applaud spiritual emotions and uplifting emotions, positive emotions. Mm -hmm. Okay. What I am saying, I think what I am saying is that the... Um, because the Bhagavad Gita is a response to an ethical dilemma, uh, and I'm not in any way marginalizing the, the, the ontology of the Bhagavad Gita or its soteriology or its epistemology, um, but it is primarily in a response to an ethical dilemma. I will later try and explore, if we have time, perhaps not in this podcast, um, how Arjuna's dilemma although it has a context on a battlefield, it, it kind of epitomizes the human condition for all of us. It's, th there's something about his dilemma with which we can all identify as human beings. I think and we need to Ham frame Hamlet, it in a manner that we can identify. Huh? Hamlet says to do or not to do. And it's similar to Arjuna's to some extent. I think that's a universal predicament, isn't it? Do we get entangled in the uh, factions, or is that something different? I'd have to think a little more about Hamlet, but it may be reflecting a similar tension here um, that, that afflicts us. I'll come to it later because I, I, I'm going to cover that later, and I'll, I'll make a note of it. But I think what, what's important here is how the self is, is, is important, the eternal self. And keep in mind there's a dualism here. Um, but also keep in mind that this is not a Cartesian dualism, which is largely disfavored in philosophy these days. It isn't the mind-body dualism, or perhaps more exactly mind-soul body dualism. The differentiation that the Bhagavad Gita, based on Syankhya philosophy, makes between the self and the mind is a very important one. And perhaps the mediating role of the mind between the true self and the physical body um, will help resolve some of the philosoph philosophical problems about the relationship between, in Cartesian terms, the mind and the body. And I think ethically, there are some questions. For example, we often talk you see, the problem is discussing this um, dialogue between representatives of different cultures. 
is that sometimes one tradition may present a concept that is unintelligible to a person from another tradition. And I'll give you an example. In the Western uh, tradition, we'll talk about human nature, but that is largely unintelligible or partly unintelligible to those who are coming, to those who are followers of the Bhagavad Gita. Because the human, there isn't so much a human nature as a spiritual nature. Mm. That's not to say that humans may not have some kind of nature that's different from animals and so on. But it does really um, give us a different perspective. I forget who said that. We're not human beings who may sometimes have a spiritual experience, but we're, we are spiritual beings who are currently having a human experience. Yeah. It's attributed to Stephen Covey. It's attributed also to Tilhard, uh, that Christian thinker. Tilhard, uh, forget his full name. Yeah, but that's a very significant quote. It's interesting yeah. that even in the Western tradition, some people have got that uh, insight that our human journey is just a part of our 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 existence. Yeah, but it's 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 central to the Bhagavad Gita. Um, so the, the the idea of the Atman is there. Um, I mean, I th- I I I personally I, I think the first six verses of the the Bhagavad Gita are so important. Um, I mean, even in, the, in text 11, Krishna says, one who's truly in knowledge does not lament. So taking the ability to uh, not be overcome by debilitating lamentation, I think probably we all experience it, but to, not, but to have some um, emotional resilience is connected to knowledge. Because in that first verse, Krishna says clearly, one who is actually in knowledge does not lament. So immediately there's a, there's a link between knowledge and virtues. Text 12, never was there a time when I did not exist, nor you, nor all of these kings, nor in the future shall any of us cease to be. Um, again, Lord Krishna is... Not only in the previous verse, I, uh, Krishna's told Arjuna, you're identifying with the body, therefore you're a fool. He's now saying the real identity is that you're eternal. And in this verse, he also explains 2.12, uh, although it's kind of somewhat implicit in there, um, that there's a plurality of, of, of selves. It's interesting, he uses the first person, the second person, and the third person in this verse. You, I, and all these kings and soldiers. Okay, yes. Yeah. So it's first person, second person, third person. It's, I mean, from a, by the way, from a pedagogical point of view, how Krishna teaches is very interesting. He doesn't start, Arjuna, I'm God. And this is what I'm going to tell you. He starts to relate the learning. I mean, he did actually rebuke Arjuna in verse 11. Um, But then in verse 2, he relates this knowledge, this understanding to where they are right at that moment on the battlefield, situated on the chariot in between two armies. So he, he, I mean, so there's a case for saying that Lord Krishna is giving Shastric knowledge, but he doesn't separate it from the experiences that we have. So I think there's some pedagogical lessons there also in how Lord Krishna teaches the Bhagavad Gita. Beautiful. So in one sense, if we say the first statement is a philosophical assertion, but the second statement immediately comes down to the level where, but in the battlefield, 
and then yeah. same same way i think the third statement goes up but the fourth statement comes down to conte and uh, bharata is referring to yeah, well, we can, yeah we we can go through those if you want to yeah i mean the uh, i mean there's a sense how can i put it probably in the second um verse 212 there's a, there's a sense of immediacy there you know here we are on the battlefield <laughs> and 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 that's interesting there is a uh, i think in counseling and teaching sometimes one um responds to the immediacy of the situation rather than the lesson plan one has so i think there's some very important pedagogical principles there and then the first third verse is very in, uh, number 13 third of these six is very interesting um because it's something very much one can identify with it with as the embodied soul continually passes in this body from boyhood to youth to old age the soul simply passes into another body at death a sober person is not bewildered by such a change in other words a sober person can understand this with a little reflection if you just reflect on this for a minute perhaps forget you're on the battlefield and all of life's um problems you can actually understand this not 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 a necessarily very complicated teaching but one which is very profound and affects us all and we can all identify with it i know i i was a baby i was a child i can remember it then i became a you i can remember that i experienced i had the experiences through the body of a you i experienced them not chaitanya chaitanya charan you didn't experience those things therefore if i want to share my experiences i've got to tell them to you and now as i'm 69 years old i'm having certain experiences I remember when I was uh eight or nine years old my mother went to the optician she left me and my brother in the car while she went to the opticians um and at that, I remember I was looking out and I was thinking how detailed my sight was you know that that, that which I could see how that picture in front of me how detailed it was I could look at this amount and see a lot of detail I could look at this amount and see a lot of detail. I could look a lot smaller and see a lot a lot of detail. And of course I had very good vision, 20/20 vision as a young person. Now I have some problems with my eyes. However, the one thing that's absolutely clear to us is the person who is feeling some pleasure, oh my vision is good. I don't need to go to the opticians like my mother and feeling some pleasure is exactly the same in essence. as that person who is now feeling uh some discomfort with having to wear glasses mm. and we can challenge people if you don't believe this then why are you afraid of death because death if you think that you're a different person a different entity a different being then why don't you jump out of the window right now because the person who hits his or her head on the pavement two or three seconds afterwards will be a different person <laughs> we know uh-huh. we know i'm not i i'm worried will death will death bring me pleasure will it bring me pain i'm a little concerned why am i concerned because i'm actually i know in my heart of hearts And in actually the person who experienced yeah in modern philosophy a lot of uh, a lot of criticism of the idea of a unitary self like yeah, yeah. self is in a state of flux but this is quite a simple argument actually it's not necessarily a knockout argument but it's a very sound argument that it's not that the mm-hmm. self is in a complete sense of flux there is a substantial level of continuity in the self and what you said earlier, a, yeah. what you said earlier about differentiating between the body mind and soul that also helps us uh, make sense of the flux in a in a way that does not uh, that does not yeah. deny the ontological reality of the self 
otherwise the no. flux is used to used to sometimes infer that the self is just a like a what is it a social or psychological creation or a, bun- a bundle there's the bundle theory which was propounded by Hume uh, and there may be different versions of the bundle theory but our identity is like the ad- identity of a bundle of objects um but actually if you can if you actually analyze a bundle of anything it's still always changing take anything in the material world analyze it over a short time period a time period any time period but even if you make that time period go to zero in newtonian terms you say it should tend towards zero mm-hmm. you will always find some change in that so that bundle which is greater than zero it will never go down to zero mm-hmm. so the idea that this identity is a bundle is is a, it's a fabrication it's a way to avoid i think the natural conclusion the common sense perception um and common sense perception maybe sometimes right and sometimes wrong but it, uh, it it's it's quite an enduring perception that the self continues that uh therefore a mother will always look upon her child as my son even that the son is 70 years old the mother is 90 something <laughs> she still thinks this is my son so okay okay it may not be perfect perception but there is some idea uh, that rests there is an idea or a perception that rests on a a truth somewhere that indicates some some truth intimates a truth so the eternality of the self it's unchanging otherwise how could you you know when there's a crime the police look for the same person they'll have an identity parade but unless the person is essentially the same person how can you hold them accountable morally and criminally for what they've done mm. and i think you do have, i i think you have to make a decision here are you the same or different rather than saying well it's kind of the same kind of different i mean we need to be aware of setting a false dilemma but i think in this instance we don't and the conclusion of the six verses is that there is that's not a false dilemma there are two elements na shito vidite bavo na bavo vidite sutaha obeyorapi vishto antas tanayo satadarshini yeah tatva yes thank you yeah the seers of the truth have concluded that there are just two energies one which is always changing and one which is never changing therefore this idea that actually the soul can be created but then it's not destroyed uh, it's um at least from a philosophical perspective it's it's untenable i mean one could resort to such reasons as god can make it happen mm. Mm. but 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 that's somewhat questionable because one could use that for anything um and i i think from a from a more philosophical perspective that idea that you can create something and then it remains eternal it, it is um i'd call it philosophically naive but yeah actually i was surprised i mean not just surprised it was too mild a word i was i found it almost absurd the idea of uh, eternality being defined by some people as having a beginning but no end it's yeah. like saying something is semi infinity half infinity yeah. you can't really yeah. have half infinity infinity is infinity absolutely hmm. absolutely so yeah going back earlier to if you want to discuss this since we are getting into the intricacies of the self you said the the role of the mind as mediating between matter and spirit differentiates uh, the sankhya duality from sankhya dualism from say the descartian dualism that is rejected in the west mm. 
how exactly does that make a significant difference? Because we do say mind is still matter, although it's subtle matter. So, is it that the mind acts as a mechanic? Because one of the main problems with Descartian dualism was that how does a how does a non-material soul, or in this case, he uses the word mind as non-material, how does that affect the body? And then mm -hmm. they, they have the idea that. Uh, mm -hmm. matter is causally complete and that's mm -hmm. why so does are you talking about the mind as acting a mediating link in that sense or uh, I'll, I'll need to think this through a bit more um it's something i'm thinking about currently um i mean i think naturally if you make the mind material it perhaps is easier to establish a link between the mind and physical reality rather than considering it to be immaterial However, I, I, I don't I don't think you completely resolve the question of the of the relationship between the self and the physical body, even though it's mediated through the mind. I don't think that the um, you know we've completely resolved that challenge between the interaction between the self and and the physical body. Dutta uses this example, and I've used it in my reincarnation book. He talks about it as a virtual reality that. Let's say if somebody is playing a video game, then everything that happens in the video game is happening according to the laws of the mechanical arrangement of the video games. Mm. But still, there is the person who is playing the video game. And the person is making some choices, clicking some buttons, pulling some levers, generally it is moving some cursor, whatever. And those, those don't... Uh, you could say break the rules of the game as they have been mechanically designed, but they mm -hmm. act as a stimuli. So, so he says, just as a person can play a virtual game. So mm -hmm. similarly, uh, it says the soul exists different from matter, but the, the, in the mat ma gross matter works according to material laws, but just as the computer is like the computer system is the interface between the computer software is the interface between the person and the playing the person and the game. So he says similarly, the mind acts like a software interface, which is mm, an interesting metaphor. I don't know whether it, it it explains metaphorically, but I don't know whether it resolves conceptually. I'm not I'm not too sure. I need to think about that more. I mean, certainly the 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 way that the physical laws, um, which we accept as being um, fixed. Uh, inviable if you like um in, in, interact with the moral law and and and, and human agency or let's, let's say spiritual agency how do the two interact and uh, of course there is a notion of the law of karma which is another important concept within our tradition um, but it does suggest that agency um and determination coexist they're compatible um and it, you know, obviously, you need to further articulate how they exist simultaneously. Uh, the destiny is something that can be changed, um, and agency is continually being exercised, at least in the human form of life, for the for the self. Uh, and of course, the the spiritual agency is the agency of the self, is the agency of the supreme lord, and the reciprocity between the two, as well as the laws of material of material nature, it's a, it's a complex discussion. I think the the triguna is probably a further useful concept that, um, to some degree, helps explain the relationship between free will or agency and determinism or conditioning. In the sense that the those who living beings, the Atman, who's residing in the the body of an animal or lower species uh, or, or a creature in the lower species of life, has no moral agency. Of course, this has been questioned today when there's some videos of animals looking after each other and so on. But at least according to our our tradition, they really have no exercise of agency they don't create karma hmm. uh, to put, put in our own language 
Now, the human being uh, who's in is in the mode of passion, uh, and therefore he will have um, some degree of exercise. Uh, therefore, any, any any human society has some system of morality, some kind of idea of culture of laws, what's right to do, what's wrong to do, what should be judged positively, what should be judged negatively or even punished, uh, what we should aspire for, what we should avoid, and so on. Every society has that, uh, and, and, and philosophy may be a feature of the mode of passion, according to Srila Prabhupada. Uh, in the mode of goodness, um, which is really um, refers to the demigods and the higher planets, um, there's there's a, a great amount of freedom. They can even do some things um, which are not considered as transgression of morality according to the standards we have here. So there's a greater degree of um, freedom. Therefore, those who are in the human form of life who always have a good um, component of passion there, um, but are influenced by the other three gunas, um, their degree of ex ability to exercise moral choice will be determined by how much that passion is mixed either with tamas, more rajas, or with sattva. Therefore, in the, in the, when the quality of passion is, uh, let's, go, let's go up, in the, when the quality of ignorance is predominant, it'll be very difficult to exercise morality. And we may even think that which is immoral is moral, and that which is immoral is moral. We get it, we get it mixed up. Um, in the mode of passion, we are confused about what is moral, immoral, and very often we're torn between moments of passion, uh, you know, uh, and wanting to enjoy the world, and feelings of remorse about where that passion le leads us. Mm. So there's that kind of, in passion, there's always that ambivalence, that um, going one way and the next. Uh, passion is typified by movement for example. And then when one comes to sattva, uh, there is a degree of sobriety, peacefulness, um, and one is not torn so much by moral dilemmas or between that tension between one's reason and one's passions and appetites. Mm. So I think, so I think, I, I think, I, I think the, the whole concept of the triguna lets us know that actually this um, dialectic between agency and conditioning is different for different li living beings. And they both coexist to different degrees at different times. That's beautifully put. In one sense, now you've articulated it, that the tension between, say, free will and, age and conditioning or determinism, in terms of three modes, it makes such intuitive sense. And then yeah. if we say that, say animals function in the mode of ignorance, animal bodies in the mode of ignorance, then what it means is that the scope of free will is severely limited. And that's yes. why they don't have moral agency. Now, up there, sometimes animals do exhibit moral behavior, but, uh, but evolutionaries or, or biologists do say that it's, it's largely due to, their, it's just they're genetically programmed like that. Mm. It's just that it's their genes doing it. But even hardcore biologists, they also say that we humans somehow have the capacity to go beyond our genetic imperative. That we may have some genetic conditioning, but we can go beyond it. Otherwise, there is no potential for transforming in any way. But we can't change our behavior. We can't change our belief systems. Mm. We can't mm. change our ethics. And, and even hardcore materialists or, or aggressive atheists, even atheists, they want people to become atheists. So if you are completely determined, then it would not be a choice whether I'm an atheist or a theist. So in mm -hmm. one sense, and I'm just reflecting back on your point that actually moral agency itself becomes uh, unsustainable if we become locked to too rigid a materialistic worldview. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I don't think there can be any um, sense of morality unless it's backed up with the idea or reality of a substantive self. There must be a substantive self. Certain philosophers have, 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 have called for that. 
how they define that substantive self um, may be interrogated, I think. But by, if something's really going to have substance, it must be unchanging substance for a man. Otherwise, it's not substance, the real substance. So the substantive self, yeah. So I think, you know, and there's the whole conflict between moral relativism and moral absolutism or dogmatism. Um, there must be a self. There must be a real self somewhere. And therefore, I think, I personally think when we look at the perceived decline in morality, whether that's right or wrong in human society over the centuries and decades, um, and the changes to the kind of moral conversation that's going on, I, I think we should be careful about saying that any decline in morality, if it's true, and, 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 and some will dispute that, and I think we have to look at it carefully, um, if, if you say it's due to a lack of religion, I think we have to look at other possible causes. And I think I'd, I'd paint it a little more broadly uh, in saying that actually the lack of a substantive self and the kind of the opposite, the notion of a constructed or even a fragmented self as we have today um, doesn't help in our moral discourse. Uh, I think there are other issues such as etiquette uh, and, and perhaps the breakdown of etiquette um, is, is very significant, but that's an, another discussion. Mm. Mm. But but I think I think I think this this this, this first concept, um, which is really a perhaps a, a, a very what you could call a very thick concept, a term used by Bernard Williams, which means a concept that is both ontological and evaluative. It brings together facts and values um, because you can't really consider the self devoid of values or virtues unless you consider the values and virtues come entirely from matter. And I think our my own personal take on this is that actually the self is the source of all the virtues. But those virtues are covered when we're embodied and conditioned, uh, and they're reflected dimly through matter. In other words, the real self, not man as he is, but man as he could be. Mm. I'm, I'm sorry, that's probably a little uh, gender insensitive, but these phrases we use. Um, without understanding that, what's our true self? And what's our real potential? What can we become factually? What is the full manifestation of our potential? Not just as human beings, but as spiritual beings. Unless we have an understanding of that, it's very difficult to define um, morality uh, for various reasons. So I love this. The way, let me see if I got it clearly. You said that facts and values that dichotomy or the lack of a clear connection between them, that can be established through the concept of a substantive self. The, sub the yes. substantive self is, is the, you could say, the link between the facts that are pursued and the values that are cherished or values that, because when you say that fact, so cognition rests in the self and values also rest in the self. In that sense, that's, in that sense the self becomes the union of the two. Is that what yes. you're saying? Yeah, yeah, it's something I'm, I, I haven't fully formulated, but the idea that as soon as our knowledge goes exclusively to the outside world, then immediately that we, we, we get that divide between facts and values, or we try to divide them, let's put it like that. But when we turn our attention, the, when the object of our knowledge is the self, um, whether that be through the Vaishnav tradition and belief in the Atman or whatever, or whether there's just a more self-reflective approach to the self from any culture, when we start thinking about who we are, then immediately that brings our knowledge uh, in terms of cognition and our values together. So we discussed today about uh, mainly the normative moral philosophy, if we had to have, how we, how we could have it. So it will have broadly some criteria that it has to 
relate with the self as it is, as its needs are in its contemporary culture. It has to have, it has to be an autonomous body of knowledge. It has to be faithful to our tradition. And then it has to be capable of engaging in authentic moral dialogue. And then the key concept that we focused on was the discussion of, for the basis of morality, knowledge has to start from not the outer world, but the self. Otherwise, there is this big gap between facts and values. So how are, do facts exist themselves independent of theory? That's a big philosophical question. And with the reputation, reputation logical positivism, that is being problematized. But even if we put that aside for the time being, even if we say facts exist uh, in whatever, whatever ontological status they have, but from what is to what should be, how do we link facts to values? So that means that uh, we pursue certain things and then we are driven to respond to those perceptions. So if I see a, if I see a rope and I think it to be a snake, I will want to stick it, uh, hit it with a stick. So now if our perception is wrong, then our uh, actions will also not be right. So in one sense, ethics has to be grounded in right perception. And to ground the ethics in right perception, we need to understand who is it that is perceiving. In today's world, especially through technology, knowledge and knower have been increasingly separated from, the, uh, from say the printing press where the speaker is not evident as it is in a speech or a conversation to say internet scams where a person can be pretend, a uh, old person can pretend to be a pretty young girl and cheat people. So based on that, if we under, if we ground our uh, if we ground our cognition in a substantive self, that is what the Bhagavad Gita does. And the Bhagavad Gita talks about how once we understand that the self is real, then that brings a certain amount of emotional resilience. We can tolerate the ups and downs of emotions, and that enables us to act more ethically. So, of course, how emotions what role emotions play in our shaping our actions, that needs to be explored more in detail. But in general, if we say at this stage that emotions interfere with ethical action, which, is, uh, which, is, which can be prompted by reason, then the regulation of emotions comes by understanding that there is, a, there is a substantive self. And the idea nowadays that there is no such self can be easily refuted by the fact that we are all afraid to die because we don't think it's a different self who will die. It is we, we will die. A mother who sees a child whom she saw as a baby and as the age of 70 still says, this is my it's the same child. So, it, with, so the substantive self is essential for, for also a sense of moral agency. Because if there's just matter, then where is the scope for free will? So when we talk about human nature, which is very common in Western philosophical circles, in the Vedic understanding is more spiritual nature. And uh, we are spiritual beings on a human journey. And I, the difference this makes is that there is a continuity in the spectrum of beings and that continuity can be explored through the three modes. So the scope of moral agency is very re reduced in the mode of ignorance, which is where most animals are. And it is, there's a constant tension between our cravings and our, the sense of remorse, bhog and tyaga in the mode of passion and in the mode of goodness, we come to the understanding that, that the tension between emotion and reason gets substantially reduced. So that's why that's how ethical behavior becomes much easier in the mode of goodness. So there are aspects of the self that the mind is changing, the body is changing, but the self itself is at its core unchanging. And to the extent our knowledge our self is grounded in that unchanging self to that extent ethical behavior will become easier so that self can act as the unchanging self can act as the bridge between uh, between facts and values between our cognition and our ethical action so it is a self if a self is free from maya then self will pursue correctly and then the self will act correctly now thank you for it was a Probably it was, I would say, a very deep as well as an exploratory discussion today. <laughs>
it is thank yes. you yeah thank you Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna.